there you go. So I'm going to talk about how can tech transform workplace learning. So a little bit about what we actually do. So we're fundamentally we're, a, we're um, an e-learning company, and we do two things. We make bespoke e-learning. So that's e-learning that we don't do anything you could buy off the shelf. We don't do word training. Uh, we don't do uh, you know Excel training or anything like that. If a company has a new product, a new business process, a new software system, something that's very tailored to them, um, and something they may have taught in the classroom, we put that online and we make it come alive in a really engaging way. Um, the other thing we do, having made the content, is once you've got e-learning content, you need somewhere to host it. You need to be able to track who's done the training, when they did it, how they, uh, how, you know, what score they got, whether they passed. We also uh, have a learning management system called the Chabo with the UK partners, and we sell that. And I'll talk a bit more about that shortly. But why is, why is all this going to be of interest to anyone in this room? Well. The training market in the UK is huge. These figures are from, well, that figure is from 2009. Uh, 2.95 billion pounds was spent by UK companies on external training. The vast majority of that was classroom face-to-face -face training. A very small proportion was done online. One of the things I'm here to say to you today is that small proportion is going to grow. And if you're smart, there's an opportunity for you to grab some of that slice. So why now? Why is the why now is e-learning take off? It's had so many full storms. Uh, you know, people have been talking about e-learning finally delivering for years. Well, there's a wheel of differences. Why now is different? So, why 2016 is different to 2006? I mean, in, in the first instance, we all know we've all got widespread, robust broadband internet access. Finally, the workforce is IT literate. It's not that long ago that bosses typically still had secretaries who, uh, who, who would manage the computers for them, um, or the elder people in the workforce were a bit suspicious of IT. Actually, come on guys, most of you today, your grannies probably order their own shopping online. So that barrier has been removed. Um, this is something, again, it's going to be of interest to the people in this room. It used to be, if you wanted to make 10 or 15 minutes of engaging e-learning with an interactive experience, you'd need a team of coders. You'd need a team of graphic designers. You'd need professional instructional designers. Nowadays, actually, dirty secret, some of the tools have made it very easy to produce. Um, and that has brought down the barrier of entry for people and allowed small companies like mine uh, to start to develop some really quite innovative stuff. And finally, is the positive user experience. Why is e-learning not taken off? I'm guessing most of you will have at some point done appalling e-learning and it's kind of put you off the experience. Actually, the first time you do a piece of learning that's really well executed, you will wonder why all your training wasn't done that way. You only need to be touched once by good e-learning and it gets the momentum as why that's the way you would communicate. Now, to tie that together with what's different, because it's about the, the workforce today I want to talk about, there are two big ideas in the L&D community that technology will be able to help people support. Has anyone in here, before I put this slide up, heard of 70, 20, 10 before? Okay, so there's a, there's a couple of people. So, just in a nutshell, the hypothesis behind 70, 20, 10 is that if you think about the way we acquire our knowledge, to do our jobs, so the skills that we acquire to, um, and the way we learn them to do our job, actually, probably 10% we learn through formal training. 20% uh, we probably learn through coaching or peer-to-peer -peer interactions with people. But actually, the bulk of what we actually learn, 70%, is experiential. It's on the job. It's we read something ourselves. It's we, we look around. We self-serve the learning. Now. That massive figure I put up earlier is all being spent on this, this formal training. So the opportunity for you guys, if you're interested in tech, is if there's a way we can use tech to leverage the quality of the learning experiences that happens in the 20 and the 70 components of the 70 20, 10 model, there's a lot of money to be made. So there's another big idea that's happening in parallel. This is the entrance into the workforce of the millennials. So 
people who were born in the 1980s and 90s and, and are, are entering the workforce as adults for the first time after the millennium intuitively learn in a different way to the way that I learned. They are digital natives. They've grown up with the internet always there and they behave differently. And actually, the L&D community hasn't yet leveraged technology in a way that allows us to capitalise on some of the behaviours that they display intuitively. So we, we did some research on what I mean by that. Um, and we went out to Aston Union and we asked a whole pile of graduates and postgraduates how they intuitively learn. And I'm just going to see if it's the same for this room here. So just take a second and read that question. So you've got something new you need to learn. You've got to learn it quickly. What's your instinctive way for the people in this room that they wish to learn? So, quick show of hands, how many people's instinctive way would be to reach for a book? Not many. How many would ask a friend or a peer? There's a, yeah, there's a couple. How many would want to do a formal training course and go to a classroom? There's a couple. And how many would instinctively Google or YouTube? Right, and, and you won't be surprised that you know when we when we did that tested with face-to-face -face interviews, it was it was a similar proportion. So there's ah five minutes ago. So there's both a huge opportunity and a huge risk there. So the opportunity or, 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 or the the behaviour you want to encourage in millennials is that self-serving the knowledge. That's a brilliant thing. If you're an employer and you have people who are motivated to self-search their learning, that's a great behaviour you want to encourage. The risk, and again, this is where some of the technology opportunity is, is if you search, if your workforce is searching on Google or YouTube, you as an employer have no filter on the results that are returned. The content is not curated. So the real opportunity is making excellent content and making sure that it's served to this generation in a way that's curated. So how will that be done? Well, our prediction is a rise in micro-learning. What do I mean by micro-learning? I mean learning that's specific uh, to one subject content that's delivered in under five minutes. In actual fact, very much the best of it is delivered in less than that. And it's served at the point at which you are required to do the task, or, or very shortly before. And crucially, it's content that you take on board away from the classroom formal environment. So how do we, how do we deliver that using technology? Well, again, this is the opportunities for the people in this room. So I predict there will be a huge rise in firms and corporations commissioning the, com uh, the production of video. Video is a great format. If anyone here has got a Linda account, this is a great example of what I'm talking about. Um, live action, short, focused videos can be put together with an iPhone. You can film people in the workplace doing something very well. And if you can find a mechanism that allows people to serve it in a quality assured way, you will harness the workforce's ability to train themselves. A step on from that, Interactive video, and this is something we're working on. So again, it's video, but you film, um, it, we are able to simulate a conversation with a real person. The real person talks, questions come in, the, your response to the question changes how the video progresses. You can give tailored feedback to the individual, and it feels like a coaching session. Animated video. If anyone here wants to look at excellent examples of this, go on TEDAD. If you're a Flash developer, you could work, there's a whole pile of money to be made working with people who know their content, are putting it together, um, and, and who can animate over uh, a very good narration. So if, if you were uh, worried about the death of Flash and you're in that business, get involved in Adobe Animate, and there's a lot of opportunity there. And then for us, what we do, we make interactive e-learning, which is kind of a hybrid blend of all those things. It's not going away, but what I know is we'll be making more and more, where we used to make 20-minute, half-hour pieces of content, we will be making more and more five-minute, three-minute, one-minute bits of content that are designed to be served at the point of need. Because of time, I won't talk about some of the other points. Um, we also do software demonstrations that, again, rather than do a whole course, we do it on a transaction level basis, served at the point of need with, with FAQs and so on. Just if you're thinking about getting yourselves in this game, 
the best lesson you will learn about trying to produce bite-sized learning is it is hard. There is a fantastic quote. I've written you a long letter because I didn't have the time to write you a short one. Yeah, we can argue over whether it was Mark Twain, Pascal or Cesare who said it. The sentiment is spot on. Um, if, if you have the skill to take complex information, to distill it, to make it succinct, and to communicate that in a way that's engaging to an end user, the world is your oyster and there's a market there to be exploited. I've talked a lot about the type of content we're making. The other big opportunity is the systems that will serve it. It's back to that curation. The point around, it's all very well creating the content, but how do you ensure that your workforce only sees the quality assured content you want them to see? And this is where workplace, workplace platforms that perform like Facebook, that perform like Twitter, that perform like LinkedIn, that are the familiar environments that the millennials are used to working with, but have a level of control by the employer, if we can land that, employers will with you and there's a lot of money to be made. If anyone in the room is interested in this, um, for your own workforce, we've got a great solution called the Chabo, I'd be happy to talk to, talk to you about. But we're already seeing, we're working with these kind of organisations. Uh, you can see it, it tends to be big organisations that are getting this, but if you're used to working with SMBs, or, or smaller businesses, this will trickle out across the whole economy uh, and there's opportunities there for you all. If you're here and you are a developer and you think you've got uh, some skills to offer to help me make this engaging content, to get it online in a way that's attractive, immersive and exciting for end users, please, after the talk, feel free to come and speak to me because I'd love to hear from you. So in summary, Technology is going to transform um, workplace learning. If you want to ride the wave, it's going to be a very exciting time. We're looking forward to being part of it, and I hope some people in this room will be part of it too. Thank you. Thank you, Guy. That's great. Yeah, yeah. I've got, I didn't got any questions for Guy on that. Yes, over there. If you wouldn't mind just waiting for the microphones, that would be really great. Thanks. Hi. Um, so you mentioned about the way that millennials uh, learn, you know, they have different methods of approaching learning. Is it possible that that's an artifact of, for example, millennials typically uh, have their experience of learning as they're learning quite general things, whereas if you're older and already in the workplace, a lot of the things you need to learn are organization specific. So I can't go to YouTube, for example, and ask uh, how would I learn how my business is my business. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you've, you've got it. So, so what we're trying to marry is that behaviour of wanting to learn in the bite-sized chunk mm -hmm. with the fact that actually organisations do have very specific content that actually may not even be on YouTube because it's so specific. Uh, and the historical way is the organisation would go and make a you know, a three hour, three day course, take people out of the classroom, put them in, and that's not the way the millennials want to learn. So it's marrying those two dynamics is where a lot of the opportunity lies. Okay, um, so ju just as a quick follow up, um, what I mean is rather that, is it not necessarily the case that millennials will get into businesses and then realize that they would prefer to learn face to face uh, for the but, 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 So there's, there's a room for, there's, the tens never going anywhere because mm -hmm. there is a room for formal training, particularly in compliance and and you know anything. You, if you before you let someone launch a space shuttle, there is a there's a, a space for ten. But actually, I'm coming at the other way. So I'm not a millennial, um, and, and I'm actually starting to realise I love to learn the way these people learn. Just you know, we have a say in the office, JFGI. When you get stuck on something, you can figure out what that means. But those kind of behaviours are really quite empowering for me when you realise we've we've virtually got the sum of total of human knowledge at our fingertips if you know how to access it. So, so it's those behaviours, but quality assuring what's returned. Cool, thanks. Any more questions? Oh. You, um, you talk about um, workplace learning. I, I just wondered how important do you think to, um, tech certifications um, now a plus security plus this in there and stuff like that are in today's world. So 
so uh, so I think I think the question was about how important certifications are for corset cradle. Is that yeah yeah yeah? So so that's something I don't think has changed in the current uh, climate. There is always going to be a place, particularly for recruiters, in having quality control badge marks for some of the learning that you've done. Otherwise, how do you know you're not just taking some off the street? If you are talking about, you know, for instance, in project management, having Prince 2 certification, or you know, some of the ITIL type qualifications if you work in IT, there will always be a place for those brownie badges. But my perception as an employer is still that actually, they don't they don't prove anything so it's just a filter it's, a, it's an important filter for the recruitment agencies and chances are you might not get a job interview without them but from me as an employer's point of view when we do an interview that's not what i'm interested in i'm interested in your ability to find out what you need to do just before you need to do it apply that learning quickly and effectively thank you cool any more and we're done. Thanks, guys. Have a round of applause, uh, round of applause for guys. Okay. Thank you. Um, does anybody want to give themselves a pitch? Yeah. There we go. You've done it a million times. I've not done it in like three or four months. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Nobody else has said anything, so. You do 30 seconds each. How's that? <laughs> Okay. All right. So everyone knows. Everyone knows that cards are boring. You know, birthdays, anniversaries, evictions, new jobs, new homes. Cards are boring. So um, you see, everyone comes up to me and they tell me, Adrian, Adrian, sending and receiving a personalised message, but on a potato is funny, quirky, and memorable. So you see, because of my story, my business, my character, my everything, I've created two kinds of people in the world. And in fact, there are now two kinds of people in the world: those who send boring old cards and those who send personalised messages. But on potatoes. <laughs> also, I'm working on a side project, and if anyone here has any IP knowledge, like a solicitor, or if anyone here has any experience in like uh, managing managing communities, like on Facebook and such, please contact me. You know, I'll be with pizza. So let's talk. Thank you. Who's next? Do you want to do a quick one? Yeah. Sorry, uh, could you do? But you can do it next, Sean. Can't do it next. <laughs> Uh, hi, um, I'm Trevor Coombell from Tech Insure, and I specialise in providing insurance solutions for technology companies. Um, so that's everything from professional indemnity to cyber to liability of any sort around tech companies. And I'm coming across regular cases where people are arranging cover and it's not on the right basis. So my offer to everybody is that if you've got any queries to do with insurance, or if you would like me to review an insurance policy that you've got in place, I come to every Tech Wednesday and I'm happy to do it on your behalf free of charge. Thank you very much. That's good. That was worth just coming, wasn't it? Uh, so next up we've got Peter, our first Peter of this evening. We've got two Peters. Uh, he's going to tell us about Bitcoins. Blockchain technology, which I'm looking forward to because I don't understand it at all. <laughs> Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah? Right, um, my name's Peter. Uh, I organised the first Bitcoin group in Birmingham, well, Bitcoin blockchain group. Um, the reason why is because this time last year I was looking around for people that I understood uh, about Bitcoins and blockchain technology. Couldn't find anyone. I thought, well, might as well organise it myself. So I started organising the group. We meet roughly once every Thursday. And um, part of this pitch is because I'm looking for new members. Also, we're looking for um, artists. And also, we're looking for people who have got a product or an idea that would like to stream live on the internet and uh, web streaming service that we provide. Right, uh, to get down to blockchain technology, what is it? It's basically a public ledger which uh, records transactions that have been taking place between two different or multiple uh, web um, wallet addresses. It's very linear, it's very um, time. Time or time or this is simple reason being that that helps with the um, making sure everything's correct and everything is being tidy. If you're looking for a deep um, 
understanding of what talking manager is. You're not going to get it this pitch. Like I said, I'm looking for certain people. Right. Um, now, it also uses nodes, which are like basically computers connected to the to the, uh, the, the chain, and it records everything that's been happening, the transactions uh, that's been going on, etc., etc. Right. Um, blockchain technology apps. I wasn't going to go more about the blockchain technology what it does, but I've got, I've got the impression that most people have understood that. Do, do you understand blockchain technology and how it works? No. Okay. Okay, well, then. So, <laughs> right, yeah. So, every trans. The easiest way to, the easiest way to explain it is just think of um, PayPal. Right? PayPal is just basically sending send money to another email address. And that's what happens with, uh, with, uh, with blockchain technology and Bitcoin uh, web addresses. In actual, so you send me, um, say you want to buy a newspaper online, and that newspaper is a penny. You can do that. The uh, the cost of doing it is going to be extremely uh, minimal, if if not non-existent. And you can pay for it. You can pay any amount, uh, any any amount of multiples um, to zero point zero 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 one. So if you had, if you had a bit of a um, uh, content that you want to sell um, and you're finding it difficult, you can use Bitcoins to, to sell it. Um, I think this is going to be the future of the technology. Um, it's going to help people um, do transactions cheaply and efficiently and it's also going to be very, very uh, secure. Now, the, uh, the, the blockchain technology is obviously is going to affect the, uh, the economy uh, and the banking system. Uh, Put it another way, uh, just think of the internet 20 years ago. If I said to you 20 years ago, you can uh, send a message to 3,000 people within a, within a millisecond, and I want to get the message, and they all can act on it. You think, yeah, but, well, at the time people are doing that, it ain't going to happen. Well, it has happened. The uh, internet has, has completely changed our lives. Uh, people see people walking around with uh, what I call the Facebook neck, just like that, all day long, and it's... It has radically changed our lives in 20 years. Where blockchain technology is today, within 5, 10 years, all of us will be using uh, sending coins or using it for, uh, for transaction of one form or another. Now, the sort of apps that we can use with blockchain technology, obviously, is the banking system. That's where the banks are getting involved. Uh, Bank of England went to one conference in Birmingham, and the Bank of England had their representatives there. Uh, obviously, if you can send money across the world anonymously and cheaply and securely, that's going to affect the banking industry. Uh, another thing it's going to affect is security. Uh, the, the best ones I've heard is for cars. Uh, a friend of mine is, up, is uh, creating a, um, a system for using blockchain te technology to secure cars. That's going to be very interesting. Uh, it, things like blood diamonds. Obviously, all blood diamonds can now be recorded. All, all diamonds can be recorded. So, if a blood diamond comes on the market, obviously it came from uh, an illicit source. Another way you can use it is for art and music. Uh, you can, you, you won't need uh, expensive uh, copyright laws in the, in the future. You just use blockchain technology to uh, make sure everything's secure and everything's different. And. Uh, Food. That's another thing. You probably heard about it in the newspaper the other day uh, about f uh, free range chickens and whether it's uh, free range chickens. Well, it turns out there's a way you can use that. You can, you can uh, uh, test that. Like I say, you can go to the millionth, uh, a thousandth of a penny, you put the stamp on all the eggs that are produced. You now know that came from a certain farm, and that farm practices uh, free range. Or uh, with chickens, so there's a lot, there's a lot you can do with it. I personally, I'm, I'm into art a little bit. I'm not of a professional artist; I'm an enthusiastic amateur, and I've, I'm looking for artwork. So this is why I'm looking for other people who are artists. If you, if you, if you're an artist or you must be an artist, come to me. We can use blockchain technology to secure uh, the originality of your artwork. And in, in that respect, I'm going to give a load, a load of arts today for posters for people to rem uh, remember by and also to come to the meeting. Um, that's it. Anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. Thank you very much for that. Um, I'm not overly familiar 
of the blockchain and, and Bitcoin. Uh, but I just wanted, do you think that there'll be more applications uh, available for blockchain as opposed to the currency? So for example, you mentioned that copyright can be um, secured through the blockchain platform. Are there any other applications for that sort of area? Yeah, business contracts are still available. Um, especially if you're going, if you're doing abroad, if you use blockchain technology to record and to validate those business contracts. Um, like I say, you can use it for art, you can use it for music, you can use it for cars, you can use it for all sorts of uh, applications. Obviously, banking and commerce and of this, um, that industry is going to be the one that's going to be most effective. But yeah, you can use it for anything, anything where you need secure information and uh, dedicated known of source, yeah? you can use blockchain technology. <laughs> Coming again as a person who doesn't completely understand it, but, uh, but like how is it better than like a simple hash for copyright? Okay, right, because it's, because it's a non, uh, because it's, you got an open ledger, yeah, uh, everything that's recorded will be on that ledger. So it basically it's like peer-to-peer -peer validation. All those will, all those basically computers that are connected to, to, to the system will have that information. So, I mean, anything, anything can be, anything can be uh, forged or, or, maybe, uh, you know, pan, pan, pan for a start. Yeah, but if they all got a, a specific stamp on it, Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin uh, hashtag or whatever, or some other currency like Litecoin, it eliminates any doubt because everybody has seen. There are people. Uh, the last <laughs> nothing is a hundred percent. Nothing ever, ever is a hundred percent. However, it will take so much power, it will take so much uh, uh, energy to, to change that blockchain, which is basically a series of blocks in a, like a, in a chain. It will take so much power to, to change it, it's not worth it, unless you've got unlimited amounts of power and energy and money. <laughs> but apart from that, yeah, it's, it's un unviable. Any more? Cool. Yeah. Thanks for you. Oh, don't forget, uh, come down to Pool of Heat. When's your, when's your meeting? Uh, uh, once we're first aid in the changes, oh. but we're also looking for people with ideas. I'm looking for artists. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Oh. Sean, you're up. <laughs> Cheers. Good evening. My name is Sean Butler. I uh, work for a company called Truculus. And um, um, well, it turns out, if you go out on the road, um, one third of the vans and trucks on the road are basically empty. And this is an enormous waste of uh, fuel and time and energy and money and everything. And um, so uh, what we're trying to do is uh, build a tracking system that can be accessed at very low cost by the huge numbers of very small haulage companies that are out there. The big boys, they can all afford the expensive tools, the small companies can't afford it. And uh, our goal is to uh, create a tracking system that all these small companies can use, capture their transport plans so that we can determine when their trucks are empty, and then broker load opportunities into their empty trucks. So we know when a truck is at its destination, when it's returning to its home, we know how big it is, what it had in it previously, and we can sell that space. So uh, in doing so, um, we hope to sell, uh, save millions of tons of carbon emissions, but also importantly for today, um, we're hiring and uh, we're looking for JavaScript developers, particularly those who've used uh, Meteor, Mongo, Node, and other technologies like that. You can contact me, I'll be outside, or you can email hello at truculus.com. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, last but not least, we have uh, our second Peter, uh, who's come all the way from Cheswick. Yep. It is, right? I've been pressing that all day. Um, he's 
yeah, come all the way just for us this evening. Never been to Birmingham before, so be kind. Um, <laughs> he likes it. Yay! Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, 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 you can use that. So, uh, Peter is head of customer success at SaleSeek, which is a CRM management. No, the M is for management, isn't it? Uh, CRM system. Yes. Then. Yes. I'll just let him explain. <laughs> well, yeah. Peter, thank you. Yes, I have come. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Naomi. So I have come from uh, from Chiswick, not from New Zealand, where I'm originally from, um, thankfully. But uh, yeah, just just out, just up from London. Um, and yeah, basically, the, I am from SalesSeek, and that's that's where we started in Chiswick, and uh, to, we had talked to you a bit today about um, aligning the the marketing and sales processes for people who are selling B2B. Um, I'll get started here. All right, hand coded in Chiswick, London. There we go. Um, so just to take you back to what, what things were like perhaps 10 years ago um, in terms of sales and marketing, um, you know, sales was often you know, a, a very manual process with uh, with a lot of basically phone calls through you know all sorts of lists, um, and, and then that, that is still true today um, to, to a degree. Um, but you know, the salespeople would often um, be calling people who perhaps had never heard of them through marketing, um, whereas marketing was a completely siloed. Um, Part of, an, part of an organization um, that would, you know, basically throw, throw things at the wall and, and, and not know if it sticks or not, um, and uh, make as much noise as possible, um, hoping that, that someone would perhaps call up the organization you know, um, and, and, and follow up. But yeah, they were, they were quite, quite different processes, um, and I think that's changed drastically um, in the last 10 years um, with, with the dawn of the internet. Um, everyone now has a voice, um, everyone can engage with companies um, through a variety of different channels, um, social, of course, Twitter, often probably the best, best way to complain about a product for a big company is to just get on their, get on their, uh, on their Twitter and, uh, and have a go at them, but also, you know, compliment a product or refer someone else to a, to a, to a company. Um, so I think that has drastically changed uh, the way people sell and market products um, in, in, in both the B2B and the B2, B2C space, um, but particularly in the, in the B2B, um, it's empowered buyers a lot more. There's a lot more information um, being spread um, through blogs and social um, and, and the various other channels. Um, and so when you, when you become uh, a salesperson in the B2B environment, you're often dealing with people who are much, much more empowered um, with this information. Um, and so I think there's several things that you need to do when you, when you, uh, when you deal with empowered buyers, and that is be respectful of their time because they know a lot, of, a lot about your product. You know, no longer as a salesperson, perhaps someone who is um, the source of information. Uh, they're, 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 the information about the product is widely available, um, and, and so the people you talk to are often much more well researched. Um, so it's important to know that, uh, be respectful of the time, um, understand as much as possible. Um, what they what uh, what they what they do, what they have had um, communication with your company. Um, so what what do they know about your product? What have you sent them previously? Um, and that's where that marketing and sales need to work hand in hand. Um, and and which com which conversations could you be having with this prospect based on um, what you've previously said to them and what they've previously said to you? Um, and I think that's exactly right. What it, what it says up here, basically, a greater proportion of B2B um, buying process is before any contact has been made um, with you. So that's you know people researching or maybe getting your email newsletter or um, talking to their friends or it, it, all of that is, is is part of their buying process. Um, and it's and it's it's before they speak to a salesperson. Um, so all of the information that you, that you can gather on that um, by, by aligning those two processes is incredibly important. So, for, so for instance, if you if you can tell um, what emails are being read and when they're being read, um, it's it's very useful. Um, pain points. Um, so if you're not aligned, um, there's there's several points I'll talk about. It's basically uh, broken down to these uh, these four. The number is slightly wrong. Dealing with uh, unhappy customers, uh, not following up with engaged prospects, um, measuring marketing ROI, and uh, and how and using many software packages, not having them in sync. These are, these these are the pain points um, when you're in, when these two processes aren't aligned. So dealing with unhappy customers on social media. Um, I think this is social is often siloed to the marketing channel, um, but these these people come kicking and storming into the sales world if they are um, if they are already customers. 
um, it's not on the marking medium. Um, and I think to have these two processes aligned is, is incredibly important. And, and then just have mar the, the social aspect of your um, of your company aligned with, with, with all regions of the company is, is incredibly important because. Um, I mean, there was, a, there was a famous case recently where uh, there was an Asiana Airlines crash, um, and it was it was pretty pretty horrific. But uh, the uh, what was even worse was they had a automated tw automated tweet scheduled to go out um, promoting various things uh, about their about their, their specials and their flights to San Francisco. Um, and of course, this is not good if you've just had a crash that's also being broadcast on social media. Um, so it's important to be to be very aware of what's been what's been done on social um, and how that's aligned with the rest of your business. Otherwise, uh, you know, if you don't put a stop to those t scheduled tweets, and it can it can cause you uh, much embarrassment. Um, yeah, and just monitoring content in general across different time zones um, and getting visibility on that is is incredibly important. So yeah, I think social in terms of a, in terms of a strategy, um, it needs to be. Um, if you if there is someone having a conversation about you, um, sales should be a part of it, um, and so making sure that sales are aware of that conversation is incredibly important. Um, be disciplined about that and, 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 and make sure it's easily tracked um, and respond to notifications, remembering that everything you send is public uh, on social. Not following up with engaged prospects, I think this is something we see a lot of um, as part of Sales Seeker with, with customers who perhaps do send an email campaign, maybe through MailChimp, um, or do run other campaigns th through various channels. Um, and then that's all done by marketing, as I say, siloed off, but uh, but the but the sales team are really just, just beating through the sound of their own, own drum and they're not aware of it. Maybe, maybe, maybe a good sales team will check a, an email campaign 48 hours after it's been sent or a week after it's been sent. Um, but what, what, a, what, what you can really do is, is follow up with those people up to the minute if you, if you align those two processes. If the sales have, have good knowledge and the, and the processes and systems are aligned, um, as soon as someone opens an email, or commonly what we, what we have at Sales Seek is people saying, look, someone opened my email, an hour, an hour later I gave them a call, um, and straight away they knew um, that, well, <laughs> That, 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 that uh, wouldn't know that I was, I was, I was watching them or I was tracking their email, but more about they, they, um, I guess they knew that we, the person who was selling, cared about them really more than anything. You, you, you understand who, who, uh, who is important. And even if, even if people do track your email, uh, even if you are only attracting knowing from some, someone follows up with you, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing either. It's, uh, it can be uh, quite a, quite a good experience if you are looking for more information about the company. Um, yeah, so this is essentially what um, where we are today. You know, in terms of you can you can track and see exactly who's clicking on the emails, who's opening those emails. Um, but if you're not doing it as a salesperson, you're flying blind. Um, whereas you can tell exactly who is opening them um, and follow up with those people. You can save yourself time, um, but also um, be be more rigorous. Um, this, is, this is a screenshot of Sales Seek. This is our, our software product, um, and you can see here there's an activity feed which you, which a salesperson would get on the dashboard, and it combines everything from um, their accounting package to notes and, and tasks, um, but as well as email opens and click-throughs, uh, which which you know I've either had a personal experience of maybe seeing an email campaign. It was um, a Christmas functionality newsletter, um, and went away, and then uh, two weeks later returned from 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 holiday and just saw a couple of my key prospects pop up. Oh, so and so opened your email. So and so opened your email. An email that was sent two weeks ago, um, and then you see that opening being opened an hour ago. That's someone who's gone back and said, "Oh, I'm back in the office now on a Monday morning. Um, what was I looking at when I opened my Oh, that's right. It was a new sales and marketing tool." Measuring marketing now, right? This is the other huge benefit. So there's the operational side um, of, of combining marketing and sales, um, but there's also the reporting side um, where you see um, a, a, a lot better what what you know. There's that famous quote: "50% of my marketing works." I just don't know which 50%. Um, what you can do now is, if, is is get a much more accurate view on on how your spend, how your marketing spend is going. Um, so a typical example might be that you go to an event um, and you get 100 leads from that event, and um, you spend um, a thousand, a thousand pounds on that event, um, and then from that you also get um, from that from that hundred leads you also get um, ten customers. That means you've paid about 
hundred dollars per customer or ten dollars oh, sorry hundred pounds per customer or hundred pounds or ten pounds per lead um, then you might do a Twitter campaign and again you've got um, 50, 50 leads come through the through Twitter campaign it costs you 200 pounds um, the cost per lead is four pounds uh, but maybe from that 50 you only get four actual customers um, so you've got um, 50 pounds per customer Again, LinkedIn, um, you might do another campaign on a different, different social channel, um, and then you see that your, your cost per lead is £3.33, um, but your cost per win is 20 So you bring all this together, and you can sort of do it in a very easy analysis of saying, what is, what, 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 what's my best marketing spend in terms of customers' gain? Um, and you can see here that it was LinkedIn. So even though we spent the, less, spent the least um, and got the least number of leads, um, it was actually a, um, a much cheaper um, form of, of, of acquisition for customers. We bring this all together on SalesSeq in our marketing dashboard um, and you can see here um, for a variety of things culminating to bring together to see lead quality um, and we do this ourselves and I'll, I think I'll show you on the next slide. Uh, we're basically lead quality, what proportion of, of, of leads um, move down to one, how much does that cost us and, um, and how does how that, how that lead to um, customer acquisition over time. You can see here. This is a, a quick snapshot of, of, of our, our own um, our own graphs uh, towards the uh, third quarter of last year. Um, and essentially, what we've found is we've launched this business about 16 months ago. Um, originally, you get all your all your business from referrals or um, or events. So that's where you can go and really shove a product in someone's face. You know, you've gone to an event and they see it, or you know, it's been referred through through, through someone you know, um, whether that's an outside, whether that's an existing customer, or, or someone from from an employee. Um, that's these two here, or an event. Um, and then we have a very small amount um, of inbound. And what, what you've found is you can also compare this to the cost. And of course, events cost a lot, um, but, but inbound is relatively cheap. Um, and that's what you want to grow over time. And you can see this is our, gro our growth graph here. Of, it, it, it's always how you get your early customers. It always costs a lot early on to go out and, and meet people, unless you, you know, achieve some, some amount of variety really early on. Um, but then slowly your inbound should grow, and, and that's the cheap leads. Um, using many software pages and not having them in sync. This is pretty. This is pretty self-explanatory. There is a lot of tools out there that people use, and it's important to make sure you can bring them all together. Um, as tech companies, I'm sure you know that. But you know, having having a tool that you can show your your support tickets and your marketing tickets and and or your marketing campaigns, um, as well as your accounting, all in one place is is incredibly important. Um, and the cost of not doing that, the costs of doing that are, are obvious. You know, if you don't. Uh, if, you, if you're trying to sell to someone who's got an open support ticket, that's never a good idea, especially if you don't know that. Um, and similarly, if you're trying to sell to someone who hasn't paid the last invoice, that's not very good either. So um, I think uh, yeah, use, using, using uh, the technology that's available to make sure everything's in sync is incredibly important, um, along with marketing, but every other tool as well. So yeah, that's, uh, that's SalesSeq. Thanks for listening. Um, any, any questions? Yeah. Any questions? Yeah. That data you put up where LinkedIn is that real data or is that just data you've put up for the for the talk? Like, like is that real data or is LinkedIn the cheapest route uh, conclusion? No, that, that was no, that was not real data. No. The only real the only real data <laughs> the only real data there was actually was actually the slide um, just after the campaign uh, the other marketing dashboard. Yeah, one at the back. Thank you for your talk. Uh, this is more of a selfish question, to be honest, because I just want to learn from your experience. Um, who are your competitors, and how, how have you sort of differentiated yourself from them? Um, thank you. Yeah, good question. We are in a very competitive space, um, and. Uh, we, uh, competitors in terms of CRM um, have historically been, I mean, Salesforce, you know, um, Pipe Drive. Um, all the, but there's a, I mean, I could, if you go to our website, actually, we've got a list of all the competitors. Um, we do, we do that for, we do that, we do that for, for a couple of reasons. One is it's great for SEO. So if anyone searched pipe drive versus Salesforce, we're one of the few few sites that actually list those two on one page. Um, but uh, but also just because there's a large number of um, of tools out there, and I think. Uh, what we do to differentiate is design led, um, very visual. So, so we've got a very, and so people who, who, who like sales seek appreciate the visual nature um, of our sales pipeline here. Um, and I think 
that's incredibly important in today's world, and, and it's something that we can take advantage of being a modern application. Um, what else we do? Uh, we, we do sales and marketing from the ground up, so we haven't started in sales or started in marketing and then tacked on the other part because we thought we thought that's what people wanted. Um, so I think doing that allows us to have a, a more native feel um, rather than uh, perhaps other, other tools. And, and, and generally other tools are not really doing that for uh, for the reason of aligning, but more just as, a, as an honor. For instance, HubSpot, you know, they've released a, a CRM recently um, and they've done that to basically push you towards their um, thousand pound a month marketing package. So, you know, essentially, and, and so and so when you compare us to them, you know, we're a lot more cost effective. Um, so yeah, there's, there's, a, there's several things. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Any more? Yep. Okay. Thank you. Just wondering, what size organisation lends itself to this process? Because as a smaller organisation. You might spend all day filling in data to populate this. So we don't have a marketing department. I'm it. I also clean the toilets and make the coffee and whatever. So what's the optimum size starting point to use a, a, a system like this? Yeah, it's a good question. I did talk about silos of your marketing team to your sales team, um, but generally I think uh, we, we find people have, have great use in sales if they're a sole, sole operator. Even, even yourself, um, you know, you, you having real-time feedback on email campaigns is something that you probably wouldn't get um, unless you went specifically into that tool. Um, as with uh, your perhaps your, your support ticketing, if you use that, um, or your or your accounting tools, having all that in one place um, is, is useful if you're focusing on sales. You don't want to go, oh, I want to sell to this person, but do we send him an email campaign? Did he open that email campaign? Or, Oh yeah, do, oh, yeah, okay, so you, you know what I mean? So I think uh, any size organisation, but we, our, our own tools focus on SMEs, so sole operators to a, te a sales team of 20 people or 30 people. SalesSeek is a startup fairly new as well, isn't it? Sorry? SalesSeek is fairly new. Yeah, exactly. You keep telling that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So been on the market about, um, about 14 months now. Awesome. Any more questions for Peter? Oh, brilliant. Thank you very much.